aware of the decision. So I'm going to do the exam tomorrow. Okay? If that's a surprise to some of you, I hope it's not. Um, so the idea was that uh, uh, tomorrow at 11.15, Thursday at 11.15, we'll do the exam here. That way on Friday you only have to do one exam. It also gives me enough time to grade. In fact, the material that's in the exam has already been covered by me. Okay? So you are already equipped to answer the exam with all the stuff that you've done. I will also be doing the tutorial today uh, at, uh, at 5 p.m. Is that right? Uh, yeah, so the tutorial at 5 p.m., which will go over the material from the course, and it will cover, you know, everything that you need for the exam, and I'll also answer any other questions you might have about material that I've covered. And the homework should have already been turned in. The homework solutions will be posted later today, and the exam solutions will be posted immediately after the exam. Okay. And I hope to be able to grade it by Friday. Good. Yes. Yes. I'm going to give the, so the answers to all the questions of the homework will be up on the website um, soon. Okay. So uh, even if you haven't solved the other questions fully, you know you, you don't have to look at it in your own time. You can see what the solutions are and catch up with the material. Okay. So. Um, so last time we we did I mean, we, we covered quite a bit of ground. Um, we stuck with this idea of uh, Shannon entropy, right? Which is and uh, we defined the kullback leibler divergence. Right? And the idea, we proved that uh, uh, this uh, term is always greater than or equal to zero and is exactly equal to zero only if and only if p is equal to q. It's a sort of measure of the difference between two probability distributions. Um, we figured out uh, other aspects of how, uh, how this thing behaves. And, um, and then we went on to try to understand this idea of uh, typical sequences. Okay? So if you have a probability distribution, then what kind of sequence is most likely to show up? And we made a figure of this sort. So I'm just going to copy the figure out again. Uh, so on the x-axis, we have 1 over n of the log of the probability of some sequence of length n. The x's belong to the alphabet. Right? And as usual, m is the number of distinct messages. messages, uh, and k is log 2 of m, which is the naive number of bits per message that you expect to send. Okay, so we have this, and we also wrote down a couple of important things. So if, for example, x was drawn from the English alphabet, so m will be like 26 capital letters plus some punctuation marks and so on, right? The most, uh, the single most likely sequence will be all e's, right? E, 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 e single most likely sequence, and the single most unlikely sequence will be all Q's, okay? So this is less likely, this is more likely, yeah? And uh, I, I told you guys to go maybe work out a problem where you could actually see what probabilities you would get for various different sequences. Um, so the point is that uh, because this is a, a, a discrete problem, there's only a certain collection of problems. You know, there's only a finite number of sequences you can possibly make out of these letters, and each of those sequences has some probability. Right? So the probability of a sequence occurring is given by this product. Right? It's the product uh, j equals one to m. Right? Uh, P j and the, to the power of the number of the letter J that occurs in the sequence. Yeah, so that's the probability of each, each individual sequence occurring. Um, and uh, for example, therefore, the probability that you get all E's will be the product of the probability for each letter being E. So it'll be P sub E to the power N. You take the log of that, you take one over N. So this is just log of P sub E. Right? And this one just becomes log 
of p sub q. These numbers are negative because all probabilities are less than 1, okay? And, um, and then we tried to see what other kinds of probabilities will occur and there are various discrete values that can happen. And just for fun, if you guys want to work out, not in the full English alphabet case, but in a very simple case, we discussed the idea of an alphabet with three letters, right? A, B, and C. And uh, I forget how I wrote it down. And you can pick some probability distribution over here. So for example, we picked a probability distribution P A, P B, P C was, I forget, two thirds, uh, one fourth, and one twelfth, something like that. And if you take these distributions of three letters and you can make a bunch of strings out of it, you'll find that there's only a discrete number of strings and each one has some uh, probability of occurrence. Yeah? Now, so each one of these little ticks I'm making on this axis, yes? When implementing this, do you think it's easier to see if I choose a large n and then just... Don't choose a very large n, choose a very small n, okay? Choose like n is equal to 5 or n equals 10 right? and see what kinds of probabilities you get. Okay, so this x-axis is not a continuum. There's only a certain discrete collection of problems. So each one of these ticks corresponds to the value of this quantity for some sequence, right? But how many sequences will there be in each one of those values? The number of sequences in each one of those values are all the ways you can permute exactly that number of letters in many, many different ways, right? So for something like this, there's a sort of degeneracy factor which is n choose n1, n2, n sub m, right? That's the degeneracy factor. I mean, this is not meant to be a product. That's the degeneracy factor, yeah? So all those have the same probability right? because we're assuming independent identity distributed at all times, okay? And yes? Okay, and then, uh, about the notation. Yes. Yeah, so it's n factorial over n1 factorial, n2 factorial, n3 factorial, all the way down. It's the multinomial coefficient. Okay. It's just all the ways you can permute this collection of letters because all those will have the same probability, okay? It may also be the two completely different, okay, let me ask you a question. Suppose the distribution over three letters is uniform. Suppose the distribution over three letters is uniform. Then how many ticks will I have on this axis? The distribution of three letters is uniform. How many ticks will I have on this axis? One. Just one. <laughs> they all have the same likelihood, right? They're all just one third to the power n. I mean, they all have exactly the same likelihood, okay? If two of the letters had the same probability and one had a different probability, right, then there's still, there are more sequences in here than just permuted versions of the same type. It could coincidentally be that two completely different collections of letters have the same probability. Yeah, so when you, when, you, when you do the numerical calculation, you'll find that the number of ticks here is a sort of non-trivial number, okay? Nevertheless, uh, roughly there's some sort of degeneracy to the, to the number of sequences that, that can occur here. And unless there's some sort of coincidence of the type I've said, unless it's a uniform distribution or two letters have exactly the same probability, unless that kind of thing happens, right? Roughly, you can think that the degeneracy inside each tick is given by this multinomial coefficient, okay? And if you think about it that way, then there's going to be some sort of peaked function, right, which says that the single bin that contains the most sequences will be the bin where all the letters are equally likely because that, that gives you the maximum number of ways to permute. That's the maximum way you can evaluate this thing, yeah? So that's just the degeneracy. Right? But the probability, remember, is increasing in this direction. Of each sequence. Right? So the total statistical weight inside each of these uh, bins has uh, the shape of the green curve. I've lost my green chalk. That's okay. Let's see if there's any more. No. Okay, I'm going to use white chalk again. So the total statistical weight that you have inside each, inside each bin which is the probability of each sequence in the bin times the number of distinct sequences there could be, would be the product of these two things. I'll try and draw it in bold, right? It'll look something like this, right? It's the degeneracy times the probability, okay? And we proved last time 
that the peak of this is at a value which is minus h. Okay, the peak of that is at a value minus h. In other words, if you substitute here, the probability of a sequence exactly over there will be something like 2 to the minus n h. Right? I'm just saying something like because there may not be an exact sequence that has that probability because these sequences have rational denominators, right? So they have a denominator which is n and uh, the actual probability distribution may not be rational. But modulo that, that's where we are. Okay, that's the peak. And what you had done or what you will do for the homework is you figured out that actually <coughs> even if the probability distribution has this very nice rational form as given, right? And therefore, you can find sequences that exactly match the corrected expected value, right? Which belong to that bin. The actual probability of getting such sequences for large n goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And therefore, we, you know, although they do count as typical sequences, they don't cover the space. Right? And therefore, what we did was we actually expanded. So let me get rid of all these curves here. And let me just draw the total statistical weight, right, which is that guy. What we did was we expanded around H a little region, which is minus epsilon and plus epsilon of that. And we said that anything in this region, anything in that region is something I'm going to count as, I mean, it looks asymmetric. It should be symmetric around here. Right? Anything in that region is something I'm going to count as a typical sequence. So every sequence in here is my typical set A sub epsilon. Okay? And again, I urge you to do this numerically. Take the three-letter alphabet, make this chart for like n equals 10, see where the ticks are, okay? And see what the actual statistical weight curve looks like. And then we play the game where we take the limit as n goes to infinity. So as n goes to infinity, a couple of things happen. So these endpoints don't change. That's precisely why we scaled it down by, by n. Okay, so the endpoints do not change. What happens though is that you get more and more ticks in here. Because for larger n, there's more and more ways for the probability to be, because there's just more and more sequences that intersperse this constant axis. Okay? That's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is also very important, is that this curve gets sharper and sharper and sharper. Okay, to the point where you know you'll end up getting something like this. Right? Increase in. Right? Actually, that's not true. Let me let me be very clear. That's actually not true. What happens is this curve does get sharper and sharper and sharper, but it actually gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Okay? So because it's not a probability density of the type you're used to, right? It's a sum of probabilities of a bunch of ticks. Right? So it's literally one a discrete uh, distribution, right? So the curve gets very sharp, but it also gets very short. Right? But what saves you is that more and more and more points come into the zone. So as you add up that over the large number of points, it actually reaches some finite value. Okay? In fact, it goes to one. So that's what we're going to prove now. Let's just do it very quickly. So remember the definition. A sub epsilon is the set of sequences x sub n. It's a set of sequences of length n such that, okay, the one over, so well, such that if you want to write it this way, the probability of getting that sequence lies in this zone. And if I just multiply by n and sort of uh, take the exponential, you get 2 to the minus n h plus epsilon is less than or equal to this, or if you just less than, and it's less than 2 to the minus n h minus epsilon. Okay, that's the, that's the definition of the set. Is that obvious? It is, because I'm just taking h plus minus epsilon. The epsilon has to be in the bracket so that as I scale n, the width of this in that rescaled axis still is always the same. Okay, so that's why the n is outside. 
in this definition. And the signs, if it confuses you, this is a smaller number, this is a larger number. Because this is 2 to the minus n of a big number, this is 2 to the minus n of a slightly smaller number. Okay? So this is the definition of a typical set. How many sequences are in here? That's the interesting question. Yeah? So as n becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, sorry. So as n becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, there's going to be more and more ticks that lie in here. So just the sheer number of ticks and how many sequences in each of those little ticks is one interesting quantity. And the second is, what is the total statistical weight of this set out of all sequences? In other words, multiply the degeneracy by their probability of occurrence. And that's what we're going to calculate now. Are there any questions to the setup of this problem? Okay. It's actually quite non-trivial and you need to go, like, make a little animation of this to see how it plays out. Okay. Because the naive expectation would have been that the single most typical sequence, or the single the sequence that's right at the center is enough to define typicality. It's not. Okay. So, uh, so let's work this out. Okay. So now we have to play this epsilon delta games, and I'm just going to literally read the proof from the from the book, right? And uh, to keep all the epsilons and deltas fixed in my mind, right? Because it's important that we go through the proof. Okay. So the first thing we want to know is what is the total statistical weight of this set? Right? What is the probability that any sequence you draw will lie in that set? Right? So we can write that down in the following way. It's the probability that minus 1 over n log 2, right? It's a probability of a probability. Keep this in mind, OK? Right, minus h for that thing. Okay, so it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing. So this is the probability of this thing happening. Something sort of dangerous has just happened. This thing is a probability, and that thing is a probability. And if you're not keeping these things straight in your mind, it looks rather confusing. So let me step back and explain the following thing. What did I do? In principle, I could write down all m to the power n sequences. Right? I could make a giant list of all m to the power n sequences. In other words, all the alphabet letters in all possible ways they could be drawn over s some length n. Okay? That's, a, that's a very large number of, uh, you know, if I was just looking at the sequence space, there would then be m to the power n dots in that space. Now, I'm going to, in some sense, coarse grain this. Right? The way I do it is to each dot, I attach a perfectly simple label. I could have labeled them by color, right? I could have labeled them by anything. So I choose to attach to each sequence a number to act as its label. Right? It's a perfectly simple deterministic calculation. Which number do I associate with that sequence? I associate this number. Right? Since you already have the P's, somebody gave it to you. Right? For every sequence, I can simply make a number. So when I write probability of the sequence, don't worry about it. All I'm calling it is just a label that is hanging attached to that sequence. Okay? So now you have a space of m to the n sequences, but each of those dots has a little number labeled. And now I just collapse all sequences with the same label. And that's what this is. Right? This is in some sense a histogram of those labels. Okay? So what I'm asking is what is the chance right, that the label minus h is less than epsilon. How many ticks do I have close to this center point? Right, so this is just a deterministic label. And what am I asking? If I draw a random sequence, what is the, this is a, this whole thing is a random variable. A random sequence could lie anywhere here. So what is the chance that a random sequence has a label that drops it right in that bin? That's what this question is asking. Okay. Um, and I want it to be in that bin plus or minus epsilon. Okay. So it turns out that this thing has to be, well, so just stare at this for a second. Right. It turns out that this thing has to be uh, equal or greater than some number. Right. In other words, the probability 
gets arbitrarily close to 1, right? And we're going to have to work out why that is. So let me just work out and just work out the proof for that. And the proof just involves the law of large numbers. In other words, if you take an average, eventually it comes arbitrarily close uh, to the thing that you're interested in. Okay, so let me show you. Are there any questions about, yeah? Yeah, it's minus 1 by n because p's are less than 1. So this is a positive number, right? Yeah, that's fine. So what I'm doing is taking the, I'm taking this minus this, or I'm taking this minus that, right? It still works out. This is the difference between two things, right? So this, that's why you get the extra minus sign. Yeah? Okay. Ah, I'm proving that. Okay, so what, so the question is what is it? Right. Question is, the question is how much of this histogram lies within this zone? The, the total statistical weight of the histogram in this zone is the answer to this question. Okay, the answer to this question will depend on epsilon, it will depend on n. And we're going to work out what that is for any problem of interest. Is that clear? Okay, so here's how we do it. So since the system is independent and identically dis distributed, right, this left quantity minus one over n log two of the probability of the whole sequence, right, is just minus one over n times the sum of log of p of xi i equals 1 to n, because every letter is totally independent. Every letter is totally independent, yeah? So this converges to what? So this is like a sample average. So remember, we are always talking about sample averages versus expectation values. This is a sample average, and the sample average will converge to the expectation value. over this probability distribution itself, right? It's a chance of getting that, that sequence anyway, right? Another way to say this, it will then converge to this sum. So we're going to convert from a sum over the length of the sequence, as usual, to a sum over the number of letters, number of distinct letters. So it goes from i equals 1 to n to say, j equals 1 to m, right? And you get minus pj log pg. Is this clear? This is, uh, I do this all the time, right? This is just the total, this is just the, I'm adding up n quantities and I'm dividing by n. So I'm taking some sort of average. Now instead of doing a sample average, I can just take the expectation value of this over the probability distribution p, which is what that is. Yeah, and there's a minus sign there. Right, so this is h. Right? Okay, this is clear, right? Now, this arrow is a very loaded arrow. What does this arrow say? This arrow says, in some sense, this quantity, which is a random variable. Every time I run it, I'll get a different number for this. If I get a bunch of sequences, every time I run it, I'll get a different number here. It claims that for sufficiently large n, in fact, as in some sense, as n goes to infinity, this number will get very close to that number. Yeah, so what is the actual claim using epsilons and deltas? It says, you know, there exists some n naught, some n naught, such that for all n greater than or equal to n naught, so for sufficiently big n, the difference between these two things, this is the left-hand side, this is the right-hand side, the left-hand side minus the right-hand side, right, will be less than some delta. Okay, that's what this arrow means. So if you've done pre-calculus and you've really paid attention to the people doing all these proofs, when you write a limit like this, a limit is not a vacuous statement. A limit is a statement, it's like a game. It says, look, you give me any delta, you give me any delta, and that delta, you know, is a sort of guarantee that this number has to be close to that number. 
and you can make delta as small as you want. You can make delta point zero 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 one or whatever, right? And then I go away and I come back and say, look, I found an n, which could be a billion, or whatever it is. And for all n's bigger than that number, this thing will be close to that. Okay, that's what that arrow means. Are there any questions about this? Yes. N0 will depend on delta. So the, the, the smaller you make delta, the bigger I'll have to make the N to make this whole business work up. Okay? This is your standard epsilon delta game. If you're not used to it, just stare at it for a second, right? Therefore, I can make this greater than 1 minus delta for all N greater than some N naught, which is a function of delta. That n is, if you actually take a course in math, that n is very difficult to find. You have to go and play some games and see, see how to make that n not as small as practical, right? But for sufficiently large n, it'll work out. Right? So if it doesn't work for some n, make it bigger, make it bigger, make it bigger. At some finite value, you will find it. In practice, how to find it is the whole clever game of doing limits in pre-calculus, which many of you may have forgotten. But the first time you do limits, you spend a lot of time trying to find the n's for certain deltas and trying to find like the best n for certain deltas. And it's a very fun game, right? How to find the n for the delta totally depends on the structure of the distribution and on various other things. Question? Yes. Uh, when you put the arrow, you say, okay, you're going to large n. But yes. nevertheless, you still have some particular combinations of x1, xn, where some letters does not appear and they have no result. Is it right? I mean, if x1, imagine there's Imagine that some letter does not appear. Yes. Oh, I see. You're saying the probability is zero. Yes. B, S. This is all like uh, very yeah. un unexpected cases. But yeah. Yeah. So if something doesn't occur, but that the chance of that happening over large n is uh, also approaching zero. Okay. Yeah. So so that's what that uh, that is trying to imply. Okay. So anyway, it's a subtle point, but. Yeah? Okay, so as long as you trust this, it's just saying that I can get the left-hand side close to the right-hand side. Another way to interpret this thing, another way to interpret, but remember, right? Sorry, I wrote something down. Okay, so in fact, this is not, uh, no, 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 okay. Sorry, let me make it clear. Your question is absolutely right. I'm saying the probability that the left-hand side minus the right-hand side is less than delta, right? Goes to one, right, for sufficiently large n, right? Right? Right, goes to one for sufficiently large n. Okay, thank, thank you for the question. Of course, there are sequences that will lie outside this range, right? It's a, it's a statement about the chance of that happening. And the chance of that happening can be made arbitrarily small, right? This is not the difference. It's the chance of the difference happening can be made arbitrarily small. Is that, sorry, I made a mistake. I made a mistake in the original formulation that I wrote down, and thank you for the question, right? Originally, I made a, I made a wrong claim, okay? I made a claim that this side and this side can be made arbitrarily close. That's obviously not true, because some sequences will have wrong probabilities. The claim I'm making is that this thing or one minus that thing can be arbitrarily close to zero. Okay, that's the claim I'm making. Okay, for any delta, I can find an n that makes this work. So, is it not the normal conversion of It is, it is. It's a standard uh, law of large numbers. It's a standard law of large numbers. Right, that's what the law of large numbers is. It says that uh, in probability, this expectation well this uh, sample average will converge to its expectation value in probability for sufficiently large n the probability goes to 1 for sufficiently large n how close to 1 delta close to 1 if you give me a delta i'll find an n suppose your delta is 0 0.0001 okay so you want 0.999 of all the sequences that you draw to come close to this right then i'll find you an n such that that's true i'll only be wrong 0 0.001 of the time Fine. So that's done, right? So, so this is this is a given. 
So in other words, what, is, what, have, we, what have we found here? Right. Let me just write all the summary of all the things that we found. In other words, the total weight, the total weight of the typical set, right, is greater than 1 minus delta. For sufficiently large n, for sufficiently large n, this histogram, most of its weight will be between this plus and minus epsilon. Okay, where the n you find depends on the epsilon and depends on the delta. Okay, so I'm sorry for the confusion, but I'm now I've said the exact correct statement. Okay, so and it's just the picture. The picture is that this histogram, the tails of it, the total tail is delta. And I can make delta as small as I want for sufficiently large n, where of course the n will depend on the delta and the epsilon. Okay? For some n, for all n greater than n naught, where n naught is a function of epsilon and delta. Okay? So this is important because, you know, we're, we're not doing this in some arbitrary limit. We're actually doing it um, for for finite cases. So the information theory will actually be valid for finite cases of the system. Okay. So the second thing. So that's the first property. Okay, the second property, which is obvious, right? Which is what is the probability of every sequence in here? The probability of every sequence in here is merely given by this thing. Right? So the probability of every sequence. So for all sequences, if x1 xn belongs to this typical set, then the probability of x1, xn, I'm just saying something totally obvious, is less than 2 to the minus n h minus epsilon and greater than 2 to the minus n h minus epsilon, h plus epsilon. This is just by definition. Well, the probability of each sequence in there is equal to this by definition. Right? So now, what we want to do is to find, and this is interesting, we want to find the total number of sequences in here. Right? We found the total statistical weight of this shaded region, and we found the probability of every sequence in there between certain limits. And now what we want to do is to find the total number of distinct sequences in there. How many ticks are here, and what's the degeneracy of each tick? Now, how would I do that? Given that those two statements are there, how would I do this piece? How would I find the size, the number of sequences in there? You know the probability of every sequence within two limits. Yeah. I know that the integral is more or less one. Yes. So you just have to add up. So now I want you to work out with me so that you can engage with the inequalities. Work out with me the inequalities. I'm interested in the size of this set. These vertical lines means how many sequences are in that set. Right? So remember I labeled all the sequences and I'm going to call a sequence typical if its label lies close to H. I just want to know how many sequences are there totally. So the strategy you outlined is perfectly correct. So let's work out the inequalities here. So the size of this set is given by what? How would you do it? So let's say 1 is the total probability. Right, the total probability of everything must be 1. So now I want you to split that up into, yeah, which is the sum of all possible sequences, right? All sequences, right? But I'm not going to add up over all sequences. Must be greater than or equal to the sum of the sequence belonging to the typical set of the probability of the sequence. Okay, so follow what we're doing. I want to know how many sequences are in here. And I'm going to do it by forcing it to lie within some limits because I have some inequalities that I can really hold on to. Right, I have this inequality, which is guaranteed because n is big. I have this inequality, which is guaranteed because it's by definition. So I have two inequalities in hand, right? So the total probability, the total weight of this whole distribution must be 1. The shaded weight... The shaded weight must be less than or equal to 1. Right, that's all I know. So now what should I do to continue maintaining inequalities in this direction? 
based on everything that you have on the board. I want to write some other quantity here because I know that this thing lies between these two limits. So what should I fill in over there? 2 to the 2 to the which direction? It should be the small one, right? Because I want to, I want this to be even smaller, right? So it's 2 to the minus n h plus epsilon, right? So I've, I've, I'm assuming that every sequence in here, I'm assuming the worst possible case, that each of them are highly unlikely, right? And since this is a constant, this is, must be equal to the size of a set, right, times 2 to the minus n h plus epsilon, yeah? So then I found that the size of the set, uh, the size of the set, if I flip the inequality, right, must be less than or equal to 2 to the n h plus epsilon. Okay, that's how I did it. Now I want to do the other side, okay, which is the only remaining bit. So how do I do the other side? How do I do the other side? Okay, fine. I want to make a set of inequalities that go in the other direction, right? So I've got 1 minus delta, okay, that's equal to what? Okay, still tricky, now what do you do? Okay, this is equal to the sum of all sequences belonging to A sub epsilon, right, of the probability of the sequence. And that's just equal. And now? The other one. Right? Which is equal to the size of the set, right, times 2 to the minus n h minus epsilon. Okay? Now, by the way, this delta is just a label, right? I could even use epsilon for delta. Right, if you happen to choose the same number epsilon and delta in your original game, it's perfectly fine with me. I can always find an n to make it work. So you find this term. Okay? So that's it. We're done. We're done. This completely characterizes the typical set. And this is called the asymptotic equipartition property. It's written as A, E, P. Okay? So we got a little lost by doing epsilons and deltas, so I just want to bring it back and explain what we found. Uh, epsilon and delta are both small numbers you gave me, so if you give me the same number for both, I can use the same number. Yeah? So I had a math professor who always said, you know, pick a small no, in fact, he would say, pick a big number, let's call it epsilon, and then people will get totally confused. Right? But these are just labels. So epsilons and deltas are just small numbers. So in particular, I can just choose delta equals epsilon. It's some small number you gave me. The whole point is, for that small number, there's some n hanging around in the background that's guaranteeing that all these statements are true. And that n could be a billion. It could be 10 to the 23. We don't know how big the n is. Right? But in any particular case, you'll find that value of n. Okay? So what have we found? We found something very important. First of all, the probability of all the sequences in this set, by construction, their probabilities, in other words, their labels, are all numerically very close to each other. Right? The labels of these sequences are all numerically very close to each other. That's what it means to be in this band. In other words, all these sequences are equally likely. The point is that all other sequences which are not in this band hardly ever even occur. So in the large n limit, roughly, you have 2 to the nh sequences that each have probability 2 to the minus nh. Okay? So just step back, digest this. It's, it's very interesting. So when you run a bunch of horse races, for example, and you get a bunch of races that turn out a certain way, right? 
at the end of the day, all the races that you're actually ever going to get with extremely high probability, I mean, it's highly unlikely, you can make this delta very small, with extremely high probability, every kind of outcome that could happen is equally likely. And the likelihood is 2 to the minus nh, and the total number of those is 2 to the nh, and the fact that they multiply to 1 is by design because there's very few that lie outside. The rest of these little epsilons are just to take care of that. Okay, that's why it's called the asymptotic equipartition property. In the large n limit, any event that can happen is just as likely as any other event to extremely high precision. Okay? So, this is the real proof of data compression. Remember I asked you yesterday, how come when you had a horse race, right, you were actually managing to use 2 to the nh bits to run the horse race, whereas you should have actually been using 2 to the nk bits, because that's the total number of events that could happen, where k is log m. But you're actually using 2 to the nh bits. The reason you were doing that is all the other events lie here. All the other events lie in these tails, and those tails become arbitrarily small. Okay? So this suggests a method of coding which is different and new. And here's the method of coding we're going to use. Yeah? Previously, the method of coding I was using made guarantees on the expected length of the code. It made guarantees on the average number of bits you use per message in the limit of large number of messages. Right? And that was an error-free code. Remember for this horse race, for the instantaneous code for the horse race, we can write down that little table again. You could run n races and you would never make an error, right? You would always give the right answer completely. There are no errors here. But I'm only making a guarantee about the expected length. Sometimes the expected length could be greater than this. Okay? Now I'm going to ask you to do a completely different kind of code. And here's the game and I want you guys to tell me what the answer is. I'm only going to allow you n h bits. I'm only going to allow you n h bits. And with n h bits, I want you to encode n horse races. Every time. Right? And I want you to tell me how I'm going to manage it. I'm only giving you n h bits. Previously, I gave you any number of bits, and sometimes you went over, and sometimes you went under, but on average, you got n h bits. I'm not allowing you to do that. I'm only giving you n h bits, and I want you to encode the horse race outcome after n races, how would you do it? Can you do it, first of all? You can't do it because the total number of horse races is large, right? So what do you have to give up? Last time my guarantee was a guarantee on, this was a length guarantee. Last time I had a length guarantee. Now I have to make a different kind of guarantee. I'm going to have a customer who's buying my telegraph machine for the horse race transmission. Previously, I said, I'm just going to guarantee the average number of letters. And this person doesn't like statistics. says, I don't like averages. I want some certainty. I'm only going to let you do this many bits. So you go back and say, well, of course, then I cannot solve the problem perfectly because the total number of ways the races could happen is much bigger than the total number of options of sending NH bits. So I have to give up something. What am I going to give up? I think you have to not send every race at all, but just... Well, that we, that we have to do, of course. So you only label the races in here. But then there is a chance that something will go wrong. Okay, so the, what guarantee am I going to make to my customer? Not standard deviation, just tell them. Just tell them that the... Well, tell them there's an error guarantee. Okay, you tell them, look, that person says, I want zero error. You say there's no way that's possible, right? Because the total number of ways races can run is much larger than what you can fit in NH bits. Is this part of it clear? K is the log of the number of horses. The total number of ways horses can run is m to the n. In other words, 2 to the nk. That's the total number of ways anything could happen. The actual number of ways I could possibly transmit is just 2 to the nh because I'm just using nh bits. And I know h is less than k. So something has to give. And the guarantee that you give to your customer is you tell me an error and I'll give you a code that works with that error. Right? The fraction of days of the year in which I'm going to fail is less than 
right? That's what you tell them. But you keep the length constant. So we've gone from a expected length guarantee to a fixed length code with an error guarantee. And this is going to be very important when we get to channel capacity. Okay. So fine, now that we know how to do it, what code should we use? So what we're going to think about is we're going to have some large set, which is all sequences. And how many sequences are there? There's m to the n sequences. Right, and in that set, there's this set, which is typical sequences, with something epsilon, and there's a bunch of sequences. A bunch of sequences. By the way, by the way, just uh, just to step back for just a second. When I had the horse race example, and I said that I didn't get the probability distribution correct, I made the code based on some uh, probability distribution Q, but the actual probability distribution was P. Then how did the code fail my guarantee? R remember the answer to that? So remember what the answer was? Right, let me just pull out the exact answer here. So if, if I had a probability P, which is the true, uh, okay, previously, if I assumed probability P, or probability QI, and I made LI is equal to the ceiling of log one over QI, right, but actually, probability was PI, right? Then my length actually suffered a little bit and my expected length actually went to H of Q, H of Q or H of P, uh, it's H of P, it's a true distribution, plus one, plus a penalty that I incur, which is the Schoolbach lab, the divergence between P and Q. Penalty for being wrong. Okay, so remember, so the previous case, we made a code. We made a code just like we've always been making it. We put a bunch of bits and we use that code. It's an instantaneous code. We transmit it. But for some reason, I was wrong. Right? I made my code assuming Q, but the actual distribution is P. But it's not catastrophic. The only thing that happens is that the expected length goes up a little bit. Okay? Now, what will happen here if I assume the wrong probability distribution and use the wrong probability distribution to define the typical set. If you're not encoding the, the sequences outside the typical set, then you cannot transmit those messages. Well, that's true in every case, but now I'm asking what happens if you decide the wrong typical set. I make the typical set definition based on uh, the wrong distribution Q, whereas the true distribution is P. I've made the typical set here based on the true distribution. What happens if I make the typical set based on the wrong distribution? What happens to all these guarantees? If you've been following the argument so far, you should be able to tell me. Yes? I guess D goes to zero. Because unless you have taken very, very bad decisions. This goes to zero? D, D D Q. No, but this is, this is okay. uh, there's no okay. such uh, thing here. Okay, and so very, very yeah. So the, this D is different from from other things, right? So let me step back and say it again. Everybody with me? Everybody remember how we derived this? Just a simple calculation, right? What what is this the answer to? This is the answer to how long will my code be, on average, if I built the code using Q, but the actual value is P. The only penalty you pay, you don't pay any error penalty. Your code still works. What penalty do you pay? It's just slightly longer, right? Now I'm proposing to do something slightly different. I'm proposing to only code the guys in this zone. I know how many there are. There's two to the NH. So I just need NH bits. And I'm proposing not to even encode the guys outside this zone. Any guys outside this zone will cause an error. And my claim is that the error can be arbitrarily small. Mm 
So now I'm asking you what happens if I got my P wrong and I assumed it was some wrong Q? Some shift or how big is the shift, how profound, what will happen to my error? What will happen to my error? Everything will go to the wrong place. So if my bin is in the wrong location, my probability of error goes to 1. Right? Because this curve is guaranteed to bunch up close to the true H. Okay? If I get H off by even a tiny, tiny, tiny little amount, okay, my error is guaranteed to go to 1 as n goes to infinity. Okay? So that's two different ways in which these kinds of coding can behave, right? Okay, is everybody clear? Previously, it was rather benign. If I made a mistake, sure, I made a mistake, and I pay the cost of that mistake by just having, you know, the length went from 2.5 bits to 2.6 bits, and I'm still able to perform. Yeah? So that was a guaranteed length, and, you know, I didn't meet my length guarantee, but it only went up a little bit. Here, if I'm only going to pay attention to the guys in here and not to the guys outside, I run the risk of a catastrophic error. If I get my Q wrong, if I get Q is not equal to P, this H will be here, and the peak will all run to that, and nothing will be in this bin, because this H was built on the wrong Q. So it's very, very important when doing this kind of coding to know exactly where the typical sequences are. Right? So the statement is, if I get H correct with the right distribution, my errors will go to zero as N goes to infinity. If I get H for the wrong distribution, my error will go to one as N goes to infinity. And there's literally no halfway zone between these two things. Any, any questions about this? Okay. So now I'm actually going to work out the error. So let me work out the error. Uh, let's go through it, go through the calculation. So what do I want to do? I want to make a code for this thing. And the code I'm going to suggest, right? So let's make a code. If the whole sequence belongs to the typical set, if the whole sequence belongs to the typical set, there's a bunch of sequences like that in my code book. Right, this is the code book. How many such sequences are there that belong to the typical set? Right? At most, some number. Right? So at most, what? Right? So this is less than or equal to 2 to the n h plus epsilon. That's how many there are. Right? Then I'm going to encode them somehow. What's the easiest way to encode this bunch of things? I have a bunch of events, and I want to make the standard, the code in the old-fashioned way. Right? So this has gone back. You could think of all these as horses. Right? I have all these events, it happens to be a very large number, but I have all these events and I want to make a code for it. What code should I use? Shannon, Shannon code. Okay, so what's the Shannon code in this case? Homogeneous. Hmm? homogeneous. Why is it homogeneous? These are all equally likely. So, right? so my coding problem has become rather trivial. Right? It's not that any one of these sequences are more or less likely than any other. So there's no need to be clever about it. Right? So if I'm trying to encode this number of things, then what code should I use? So, hmm? Not uniform distribution. What actual code do I use? There's no probability. I want you to make a code. There are this many rows. What code should I use? If it's homogeneous, what does that mean? All the all the all the code words are the same length, right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. So you just zero 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 one zero 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 one zero. Okay, is that clear? How many bits are here? N, H, well, plus epsilon. Okay, why am I allowed to do this? I'm allowed to do this because these were all uniform. Right? I shouldn't waste time trying to make more likely events have shorter code words because they all have the same likelihood. If they all have the same likelihood and I want this many distinct ones, I just line them up. Now, in practice, in practice, how would I do this? 
for a practical code, I could write these down alphabetically. These are all strings of letters, right? I could just write these down al alphabetically. And my code is just in the typical set. I write down all the sequences alphabetically, and I just give the index of that sequence in that list. That's my code. Question. Well, N H plus epsilon. Yeah. Okay. N H plus epsilon. So that's that's one piece, right? Yeah. Is there any possibility to make it kind of instantaneous? Just to, yeah. So so if it's not in the typical set, so this is in the typical set, right? This is the typical set, and this is the complement of the typical set, right? And then we just send an error. How do we send an error? Maybe we just reserve the zero 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 code for an error. Right? And we just send 0, 0, 0, 0 if there's an error. Right? So we're done. What we now have is an error guaranteed code. If somebody says I want an error of epsilon or delta, then I find the ends that make this work and I simply encode the sequences in the typical set using this many bits because that's, that's how many there are. Okay? That's one way. Is this fine? So this is a zero error code. And of course, it won't work if my H is wrong, because if my H is wrong, almost all the time I'm going to be sending an error, because nothing is going to be in this set in practice. Okay. So let me ask now a final question. Suppose I didn't want to make an error guarantee code, but I again want to make a length guarantee code using these ideas. How would I do it? I don't want any error. I want zero error. I want zero error but I still want to transmit information using this typical set idea. Assuming I got the H correct. How would I do it? Yes? Could you decode the other bits? Yeah. Uh, adding bits at the end. Adding bits at the end, okay. Well, what code would you use for all? Are all the others equally likely to each other? So the, even among the others, there's going to be some more likely, less likely, and so on. So what code would you use for all the others? Okay, you could use the Shannon code and then you'd have to work out what that is because you'd have to then work out the probabilities of all these things. But we don't actually know, right? We don't want to work out the probabilities of all these things. Try something even easier. Try something even easier. How would I do the rest of them? So for these, use about NH bits, right? And for these, how many bits do you want to use? What's the worst case for all the others? All are equally probable. So how many bits do you need for all the others? One. No, no, no. You need NK bits. You need NK bits for all the others. Right? So we're going to pretend that we don't know anything about the statistics of all the others. We're going to pretend they're all uniform. And if they're all uniform, we have to use NK bits. We're going to hope that we have to use very few events of NK bits. We're going to have, okay? So what is the expected length of this code? We've just made up a code. So what's the expected length of it? If X does not belong to A sub epsilon, then just use NK bits. Right? So what's the expected length of this code? Let's work it out. Right, so the expected length of the code is the sum over all sequences right? The probability of the sequence times the length of the sequence, right? And we're going to split it up into two classes, which is uh, within and outside the, the typical set. Right? And these two obviously cover the space. They're mutually exclusive. Right? Of the same thing. Px, Lx, Px, Lx. Right? And now we're going to work out what this is. So the chance that it belongs to the typical set is, right? so it's the sum that it belongs to the typical set, right, px. And how much, how many bits are we using for those? We're going to use n h plus epsilon, okay? And we have to add 1. Why do we have to add that 1? Because you always have to add one when you're doing this kind of coding because they, these may not be integers. Right? It's the same one here. 
and the sum for x does not belong to the typical set, right, probability of that and that is going to be times uh, n log m or n k, okay, plus 1. Now, there is something missing here. This is not yet an instantaneous code. These guys are going to be all the binary numbers, right? We are going to use all the binary numbers to encode this. So, how do you know up front whether I am encoding something inside or outside the typical set? Right? When I am when I'm decoding it, I have to know whether to stop at NH or NK. So, how do you tell the user that? It is very easy. Well, there's only two sets. So, in fact, you can just prefix it, right? You can just add 0 to start with and if your code starts with a 0, it means you belong in here and if your code starts with a 1, it means you belong outside and just append that to the previous code that we had, right? Because I have to know how far to stop. If it starts at a 0, I know I'm reading NH plus epsilon bits. If I start with a 1, I know I'm reading NK bits. So, it's an instantaneous code, right? So, if I'm adding 1 to every thing, then there's going to be a plus 2 here not just plus 1, plus 2 because I have to add zeros and 1s, right, which is okay and and then we have to just go through all the motions, right. So, this then becomes uh, the total probability of a typical set which is like uh, this is less than or equal to 1 minus epsilon n h plus epsilon plus 2, if I got that right, did I get that right or do I just add up the whole thing? Oh, it does not even matter, okay, okay, okay. So, this is the total probability of a typical set times this quantity and the total probability of the complement of the typical set times this quantity. and the 2 just uh, drops out. So, this must be equal to just the n h plus epsilon, right. How do we do that? We just uh, the total probability of the typical set is certainly less than or equal to 1, right. So, we can just do that. I mean, this is a very, very sloppy calculation, right. And then you get plus the probability of the non-typical set is epsilon, right. Everything else is of uh, in, in the tails of this distribution, right, n log m plus 2 because you get 2 from here, 2 from here, this plus that must be equal to 1, right. That is the L guarantee and if I shuffle this around, you in fact get n times h plus a number epsilon prime, all the epsilons come together, right, where epsilon prime is equal to basically epsilon, right, plus n log m plus 2 over m plus 2 over n. So, this epsilon prime can be made as small as you want, right. So, it is the usual, it is the usual game. So, suppose you tell me that you want a length guaranteed code instead of an error guaranteed code, I can still do it using this kind of compression, okay. So, I am going to stop with AEP for now and just summarize what we found. If you do not want to go through the epsilon delta proofs, does not matter, it is a very simple idea. When you have a large number of independent identically distributed events, then at the end of the day, the kinds of events that are guaranteed to happen, they are all equally likely. There is 2 to the nh of them and the likelihood of each is 2 to the minus, is of each one is 2 to the minus nh. And based on that idea, you can work out everything else, okay. All I have shown is that these things do not even have to work in the infinite n limit. For finite n, they actually work for any practical type of error or length guarantee you give me, I can find some finite n where these codes are actually going to work. So, it is not a large n limit idea. If you are happy with 10 percent error, right, the n may not even be that large, okay. Are there any questions? I am going to move on, yeah. Uh, for that, uh, inequality to hold also goes to 0, right? Yes. So, for this inequality to hold, the smaller you make epsilon, uh, 
the larger the n0 will be for this whole thing to work out. Okay, but in practice, for any practical case, if you give me an epsilon, I'll work out carefully and give you an n that's guaranteed to make it work. Okay, so I've said two things. The first thing is the very simple thing. When you have a bunch of independent identically distributed events, there's two to the nh of them and they all have probability two to the minus nh. And this works with what I said last time. Whenever somebody says, what is entropy? Entropy is always the answer to how many. H is always the answer to the question, how many are there? And if I ever ask you, how many are there? You should just come back and say, there's two to the nh. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is, this is actually a practical theory. It works even for finite n. Okay, those are the two lessons from what we've got. Are there any questions? Yes. This inequality? Yes. Oh, it's easy. So, so far this is all correct? Yeah? So all I'm doing is being very sloppy. The probability of the typical set must be less than or equal to one. So that's part of it. Okay? The probability of the non-typical set must be less than or equal to epsilon. So that's that. Yeah? I'm just being very sloppy. I could, I could make this even smaller, but I'm just being very sloppy. Okay? Okay, I'm gonna move on. So this is important, and it's going to be important on Friday when I give you the proof of Shannon's channel capacity theorem, okay, which I'm not going to do today. You don't need it for your exam, so I'm going to leave it for the last day. So I'm going to leaving the, the sort of uh, cherry on the ice cream sundae for the last day, right? So the Shannon channel capacity theorem relies on exactly the same kind of ideas that we've got today. Let me unpack those ideas. The first idea is that the code will work only if we're willing to have codes that work for, you're willing to wait for n races before you give the answer for any of them, okay? So the true extraction of these kinds of compression ideas doesn't work for instant, if you want to have an instantaneous code in the presence of error, it, there's no way to do it, okay? So Shannon's, Number one most important idea is that you'll, you'll be happy to wait a long time to decode a large number of events, All right? So that's why it's called a block code. You might want to decode a block of a thousand events or a block of a million events. And it's only by willing to wait for that entire block that you're extracting the usefulness of the system, of these kinds of results, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing in Shannon's theorem is that the theorem gives an error guarantee. If you come to me and say, I want the error to be less than 0.001%, then the theorem turns around and says, here's the N that works for that, okay? So it allows small error for large N. That's how that system is going to work out. Now, what, what is really interesting about the capacity theorem and what's really interesting about this result, right? But, about the capacity theorem, the really interesting thing is, of course, if I want to take a code word and I send it through a channel and there's going to be errors, and we're going to go over this on Friday, but I'll just say it now. If I have a code word and I send it through a channel and there's going to be errors, <coughs> some zeros will flip to one, some ones will flip to zeros, that kind of stuff happens, right? Of course I can reduce the error by sending the same code word again and again and again and again, right? Then the error just goes down Geometrically, if there's an error probability, you know, p, then if I send the same code word twice, the error probability is p squared, p cubed, and so on. So Shannon's theorem is not something so trivial. It's not saying that if I make the total number of bits per message very long, the error goes to zero. Okay, that's obvious. Shannon's theorem says I can keep the number of bits per race constant keep the number of bits per race constant and still go to zero error. <coughs> and then you'll say, well, what is the large parameter that allows you to go to zero error? The large parameter is not the number of bits per race. It's the total amount of time you're willing to wait before you decode all the races, okay, which is the kind of idea behind this coding. Are there any questions about that? That's how the magic actually works out, okay? Any questions? Okay, so we'll go over this again on Friday. And so now I'm going to start 
defining the idea of mutual information, which is the key to defining the channel capacity and working out the theorem. Yes. Yes. And, uh, so each time the coding will be different. No, no. The typical set is fixed if P is fixed. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's possible in real physical systems that it's going to change. Right? So, I mean, so the point about information theory is, is a theory, information theory is a theory of limits. It tells you what you can and cannot do in a certain number of bits. It's not a theory of coding. There's an entirely different discipline called coding theory, which tells you how to, ma how to make these codes, okay? Typical set coding is a real painful experience, right? Because you have to find all these sequences, find out who's over here, make the list, share it with your friend. I mean, it's a really painful thing, okay? So this is not how you do it in practice, okay? But what we proved here is you can do no better than two to the NH. Right, you can do no better than NH bits, that's for sure. You could always do worse, okay? And in some limits, you can actually approach NH. And those limits might be in principle or in practice rather very hard to decode. But so, you know, Shannon did not spend time thinking about the efficiency of decoding. That whole complexity of decoding is part of the modern theory of computation, complexity classes, algorithms, and so on. Okay. Uh, I'll leave this here just because we took a lot of time to derive it. And now we're going to move on to a slightly different thing. So remember, entropy is the answer to the question, how many? That's what the entropy is. Entropy is the answer to the question, how many? The formula for entropy it may be sum of p log p or whatever it is, but that's not the important thing, right? Uh, and the answer to the question, how many, will be something like 2 to the nh. And therefore, when you make these plots, log of how many will go linearly, and the slope of that is h. Right? I went over this last time. Okay? So now we're going to get to the idea of the sharing of information. So this is really the meat of the information theory course. I've spent a lot of time on entropy and coding because all the tricks and techniques for theorem proving that we got from that part of the course will be important to prove the final result, okay? Um, so now let's step back, forget epsilons, forget deltas, just think intuitively, okay? If there were omega options or omega possible messages, right? I'm not even talking about M possible messages. I'm talking about the results of large numbers of races and so on. It's some very large class of possibilities, right? And typically these class of possibilities will have some label N. They'll have some label N, which describes, you know, how long, how many of these things have happened before you actually have to reveal the result, right? And it's so large, right, that we're going to just represent it as two to the NH. That's what this curve is. Right, this is the log of omega, right? So if you're used to statistical physics, this is exactly, you know, Boltzmann's fundamental contribution, right? Um, okay, so what is the role of information? Okay, so this is omega zero, zero to indicate before you saw some further amount of information, right? And after you see something, Right, then the number of possibilities decreases. Right, the number of possibilities decreases. Right, uh, trivial example, you have a bunch of people in this room. The number of possibilities I have is the list of all your names. Okay, and then somebody comes and says, well, I have a piece of information. I know that the person I'm thinking about is sitting on that side of the room, or on, the, on the left side of the room. That's one bit of information. And therefore, the number of possibilities drops, okay? And therefore, omega 1, after you see something, is less than omega sub 0. Omega 1 is less than omega 0, right? So, omega 1 less than or equal to omega 0, okay? And the question is, numerically, how would you like to capture that collapse? 
So one perfectly viable way is just to give, you know, there are 50 people in the room, so omega 0 is 50. And once I have one bit of information that somebody is sitting on that side, it's literally 0 or 1, now there are 25 options. So omega 1 is 25. Yeah, but since these omegas are very large, we choose to measure information by the exponent. We just take logs, right? So we're going to define the information is just the log, right, of omega 0 over omega 1, okay? I'm trying to build intuitively why we measure things in this way. I've said two things. First, I've said it's useful to measure things in logs because these are big numbers, okay? It's also useful to measure things in logs because then we get certain additivity properties that are quite intuitive. Secondly, I'm saying, how did I measure how much information I got from learning that somebody is sitting on that side of the room? The amount of information I got is literally 50 divided by 25. So you could, you could count that as 2 or you could count that as log 2. I don't really care. Okay. So either way, but you just have to remember which unit you're talking about. If you count it in the log and it's log base 2, then the answer is in bits. Again, it's the same unit of information. So now let me ask you, a, again, an intuitive question. You can buy these terabyte hard drives, right? So I, I give you a one, or these days you can buy a terabyte thumb drive. So I give you a one terabyte thumb drive. There's some notion of how much you can store in there, right? And I give you another one terabyte thumb drive, and there's some notion of how much you can store in the second one, right? Intuitively, if I give you two hard drives, you have twice as much storage as one hard drive, right? You don't say you have some product of storage capacities. Right? So additivity is a very natural requirement you have for a measure of information. It just works with our intuition. That's yet another reason why we choose to measure things in logs. But if you are really obstinate, you can go back and literally live in a world where you're looking at the number of options before and the number of options after, and you're perfectly, you can build a perfect theory of information just doing that, right? So these are just conventions. They're conventions that allow us to represent big numbers using small numbers, and they're conventions that allow us to say simple English sentences like you have twice as much storage when you have two hard drives as when you have one hard drive, okay? Are there any questions? So in Shannon's original paper, these kinds of conventions, he shows that there's literally no way to measure information that satisfy these simple properties that we want other than the definition I'm going to show you. So in his original paper, he shows that for some very simple requirements that you might have in mind, there's no other way to define a certain amount of information in a system. Okay? So it's worth going and reading that paper. It shows that the definition of information up to these simple conventions is absolutely unique. Up to these simple conventions and up to one other silly thing, which is the base of the log. Right, the base of the log is like the unit. You can measure it in bits. You can measure it in log base 3. You can measure it in log base E. That's the only sort of degree of freedom you have when it comes to measuring information. Okay? So, this is easy. And always, in real life, always, when I have some number of options between which I'm going to choose and then I'm, some information is revealed, the number of options later is going to be less than or equal to the original. So, this quantity is going to be greater than or equal to zero. Is that fine? So this information has a nice positivity value. In particular for this room, there were 50 people before, there's 25 people on that side. The information you gave me was left or right, right? And intuitively that works because 50 divided by 25, log of that is exactly one. So I got one bit of information from you and I exploited it to do factor of half compression. Simple stuff. Now, it's actually going to turn out not to be so simple. And to, to see why, I'm going to give you a simple table. Okay? And always I want you to keep this sentence in mind. The question of how many, the answer is always in H. Okay? So, let's keep this in mind. I, by definition, is log of omega before you saw something 
versus omega after you saw something and that is going to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So, the idea of before and after seeing some things brings us to confront the idea of multiple random variables. So, far we have only been looking at one random variable x, okay, but somehow we are going to be seeing another random variable y. And we are going to have to confront joint probability distributions x and y. Okay, this is the fundamental sort of object of Shannon's information theory, these joint probability distributions. And I am going to sh draw you a joint distribution in a little matrix here. Let me see if I can pull it out. All right. And we are going to spend the rest of today's class just exploring the properties of this matrix. So, here is a matrix uh, which is x, which is y. Okay, this is y, this is x, and here is the joint distribution. So, y can take on, for example, four values, x can take on four values. This is an example and here is the joint distribution. And finally, So, this is the mathematical setup. In practice, what are these x's and y's? X's and y's are real things in the real world. Okay? Um, they are both random variables, but they influence each other. So, it, 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 it could be that the, you know, the number of birds that are sitting in the tree, which is a random variable, every time I look at it, it is a different number, has something to do with the temperature of the day, which is also a random variable. Every time I measure it, it is a different number. So, x could be the number of birds and y could be the temperature. And the question we want to ask is, to what extent is the measurement of the temperature going to allow us to estimate the number of births? And the answer to that question is basically this. How many possible numbers of births could there be? How many, what are all the options before? And once I measure the temperature, how many options are there going to be after? Okay? And I am going to divide this by that, take the log of it, and I am going to say that is how much information temperature gives me about births. Or any other pair of things you want to imagine. Okay? So, so far, so good, right? It is very, very simple. Now, of course, for a probability distribution, I do not have an explicit integer, which is the number of options. So, in what sense am I even given a number of options? I am given a number of options because I am always going to assume that every omega is given by 2 to the n of some entropy. Okay? We spent the whole of the last several days proving that h is the answer to how many, right? And the answer is 2 to the nh. So, whenever I see a how many question, somewhere lurking in the background is a 2 to the nh, okay? So, the only thing we have to do is cleverly figure out what the formula for h is. And we did that for codes. The formula for h was minus sum over p log p. Okay? But that is for one dimensional distributions. Now, we are going to have to figure out what the formulas are for h when there are two variables. Okay? So, let us work it out. So, this is everybody understands what a joint probability distribution is, right? So, the sum over x and y of p x y is equal to 1. If you add up all these numbers, it is very easy because each uh, row happens to add up to one quarter, and there are four rows, and so this adds up to 1. Everybody also knows how to make marginals out of joint distributions, right? So, the probability of x is the sum over y of p x y. The probability of y is the sum over x p x y. You also know how to extract conditionals, right? So, the p of x y can be written as p of x and p of y given x. And p of x y equally well can be written as p of y, p of x given y, where p of x and p of y were defined like this. This actually can be flipped around to give the definition p of y given x is p of x y, x comma y over p of x. And this is very simple stuff. I am just writing down to make sure it is all on the board. 
of x given y is p of x comma y over p of y. Okay. So the way I like to think about these conditional distributions, and as I mentioned very early on in the stochastic processes part of the class, the thing on the right side is just a label. The thing on the left side is the random variable. And so the normalization condition here for an object like this is when you add up over y's, it must sum to 1, independent of x. And this establishes the normalization because you divide out the chance of getting that x in the first place. Okay? Are there any questions about this? Yeah? So everybody can derive all these things, right? For example, if I had to ask you, what is p of y, oh, sorry, what is p of x given that y is equal to 2? What's the answer? p of x given that y is equal to 2? It's this row times 4 because the sum of this row is 1 quarter. Right? So if you're asking p of y given x, it has to be a normalized probability distribution. This row itself, as it stands, is not normalized. You have to divide by the sum of this row to normalize it. That's what this is done. Any questions? Okay. So, in the same way that we defined all the probabilities, I can pretend that, remember that everything we've done over the past three days, it doesn't depend on what the labels are for all the events. It doesn't depend on the names of the horses, which letter and so on. I could simply pretend that this 4 by 4 matrix, which is a probability distribution, is in fact a 1 by 16 vector, right, as far as information theory goes. Right? So I can easily define h of x comma y in the same way we defined it earlier. It, this is not even a new thing, right? So in the same way we define which must be equal to the sum of x comma y, p of x y, log p of x y, the joint distribution with a minus sign. I could choose to do that, right? And of course, I can always define h of x and h of y by using the marginals. I could always do this kind of thing, okay? Now here's the interesting question. I want to ask, I don't know something about x and therefore here's the amount of how many options were there for x to be in, the answer is 2 to the n h of x. That's how many options there were for the variable x, right? If x was the number of birds over the whole year and so on, right? So the number of options of x is measured by the entropy h of x. How do I measure the number of options of x once I've seen some value of y? For example, y is equal to 2. So what's the most obvious answer to that? How do I measure? So the number of options of x, regardless of everything else, is just this. Right? That's what we spent the last several days doing. The number of options of x is given by this entropy. In other words, 2 to the nh is the number of ways that n races could have been run if x is the alphabet and so on. Okay? So that's the number of options of x. How do I define the number of options of x after I've seen y? Well, just, just look at this matrix and, and tell me the obvious way. Yeah, replace, so replace, so the number of options of x, the, suppose I've seen y is equal to 2, then the number of options of x is given by the, this, the entropy of this row, right? So if I were to use this kind of thing, right, omega 0 before I see anything is in fact 2 to the n h of x, right? But omega 1, which is after I've seen something, is in fact 2 to the n h of this row, x given y equals 2, okay? Or it could be x given y equals 4 or whatever it is. So what is the actual entropy of that row? What is the definition of that? So h of x given y is equal to some row must be equal to just that entropy, just the entropy of that row correctly normalized, right? So it must be equal to sum over all values of x, p of x given y is in that row, log p of x given that y is in that row. 
would have used the lowercase y to indicate 1, 2, 3 or 4. Okay. It is nothing but taking that row, normalizing it to get this conditional distribution and once you normalize it, use your standard entropy definition. Okay. Fine. And now instantly you will see there is a problem. And the problem arises for the following reason. So, let us let us work out the uh, the marginals right. So, the marginals in this case are uh, so, do all the rows and the columns both somewhere now. So, uh, 16, 16 is 1 8, 1 8 plus 1 8 is 1 4, 1 plus 1 4 is half, 1 8 plus 1 8 is 1 quarter and this is 1 8 this is one eighth and this is one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter. Okay. Initially x has some entropy. Can you say something about that entropy? That entropy is certainly less than 2. How do I know the entropy is less than 2? It is not uniform. If it is uniform, there is 4 options, the entropy is 2. Okay. Great. So, the entropy is something less than 2. Now, suppose I know that y is equal to 3. Suppose I know y is equal to 3, then what is this entropy of x assuming that y is equal to 3? It is 2. Okay. So, unlike this very intuitive statement that after having seen something, the number of options goes down, here the entropy of x was something less than 2 because it was not uniform, but after seeing y is equal to 3, the entropy appears to have gone up. Okay. So, if you try and define information based on this, right, then you would be defining information in the following way. You would be writing down something like n h of x minus h of x given y is equal to 3. Forget the n, n is just a scaling factor, right. And unfortunately, in this case, that is actually less than 0. Here is an easy one though. If y is equal to 4, if y is equal to 4, then what is the entropy of x given y? 0. In which case you have gone from some entropy less than 2 to 0. Right? Totally cool. But this is very bad news. This is very bad news. Okay. So, and, and what about by measuring this? What is the entropy of x if y is equal to 2? You have to multiply this by 4. So, in fact, you get one half, one quarter, one eighth, one eighth. It is the same. So, by observing this, you get no collapse. By observing this, you get no collapse. By observing this, you get a full collapse. But by observing this, the number of possibilities went up. Right? So, something is wrong and our definition of information, which we are hoping information is something exactly like this. It is this h minus that h. Right? does not actually work. So, how do I fix this? I do not want to define information this way. So, how should I define it? How should I fix this? So, is the, is the problem clear? When I intuitively set up the motivation to the problem, it was very obvious. Initially, there were more options. The number of options could not possibly increase. Right? And I know the number of options is something like an entropy. And I want to make a formula where information can always go up. Right? I can't lose information. The number of options always has to go down. This definition doesn't work. Here you get no information. Here you get no information. Here you get a lot of information. Here you apparently lose information by seeing something, which obviously can't be right. So, how should I fix this problem? How should I fix this problem? There's a very easy fix. Not h of x and y, right? So suppose I define, so suppose I define i of x given, well, given y is equal to little y, right? Maybe I can define it as h of x minus h of x given y is equal to little y, right? That's just the same definition as this. If the omegas are two to the n h, then that's the same definition, except for a factor of n. But this doesn't work. 
wrong. It doesn't work because this i can be negative sometimes. So what's the easiest way to make this i positive? It's not totally obvious, but what, what, what's a good start? Modulus. Modulus, oh my god, no, no. <laughs> now what's a good start to make this positive? Look, I mean, just look at this matrix and tell me what, what's a good, so here you get none, here you get none, here it goes down, here it goes up, that's no coincidence. So what's a good way to make this entire thing positive? Average it out, okay? Because y itself is a random variable. It's not that every time you run this experiment, you're going to get y is equal to three. Y is going to occur with equal likelihood in each of these rows. And if it occurs with equal likelihood in each of these rows, sometimes you lose information, sometimes you gain information, sometimes you neither lose or gain, but you hope that on average you gain. Okay, so this is going to be our definition of information. We're going to define it in this way to fit with our intuitive notion that this information has to be positive. Because if we define it wrongly, it doesn't work out. So here's what, go, what we're going to do. We're going to average this the probability that y is equal to little y, and we're going to sum this right over all values of y. Okay, and we're going to define this as the information between these two variables. But now the labels have gone because I've averaged over values of y. And I already averaged over x to calculate the entropy. So now there's no more labels. This just gives a single number that defines the whole matrix. Okay, cool. Okay, so I have just enough time to finish this up. So let's, everybody's with me, right? So. I'm just trying to define something useful, and I'm, I'm, I failed in my first attempt. I'm now attempting again. This looks plausible. We'll unfortunately have to plug in a lot of stuff in there to see what this formula is, so let's, let's go for this, right? So this is the sum of a y, uh, p, so p of y is actually sum over x, p of x comma y. That's what this is, okay. and this little thing is going to be sum over x of p of x log p of x with a minus sign, and this thing is going to be a horrible thing, which is minus minus sum p of x given y equals little y log p of x of y given y is equal to little y, okay? And this whole thing gets multiplied by this. All I've done is these h's are after all defined in terms of the p's, and I've just started to go in and expand them, okay? So when the dust settles, and I only have two minutes, so I don't want to kick up the dust, right? But let's assume the dust was kicked up, and there'll be three or four lines of algebra here, right? And finally you get to the bottom, and it has settled then you'll find that there's a single formula. And this, it literally just comes out if you go through all these additions and summations and do the conditional probabilities and substitute the correct way and so on. Okay? So trust me. Yeah, it's one of these things where you don't want to do it on the board because there's going to be like 15 mistakes before we get to the answer. Yeah? There's a few surprising things about this. Before that happens, I'm just going to say one last thing. This quantity, this sum here, just this bit, right? This h is independent of y, so it comes out. And the sum of y of p of y goes to 1, right? So this part of it just is h of x. This part of it is the entropy of every row considered as its independent probability distribution averaged over all possible rows. So the second part is given a special notation, right? It's called h of x given y. Okay? 
right? And that's defined as the sum of p of y, the sum of y of p of y is equal to little y times h of that row, right? Where this notation is not the same as this notation. This notation is the entropy of that row. That's why I put the little y here, okay? So that's called the conditional entropy. And the conditional entropy is actually the average entropy of each of these rows considered as a probability distribution weighted by the chance of getting those rows, okay? So having done all that, I'm going to write the final answers up somewhere on the board. Let me see if I can make myself some space. Ah, this has to go. This has to go. Okay, so here are the formulas. I'm just going to rewrite the, well, the information formula is already there. So it turns out that I, X, Y can be written as the entropy of X minus the entropy of X given Y. That's exactly this. It's exactly that with our new definition of X given Y, right? It can also be written as the entropy of X comma Y, which is here in this formula, right? Minus the denominator part because it's in the log. Since the thing is totally symmetric, it can also be written as h of y minus h of y given x. And because it's symmetric, it's called mutual information. Strangely, it doesn't depend on which is x and which is y. It doesn't establish causality. Okay? Um, these formulas are encapsulated in this little mnemonic, right, where you can consider the whole sort of figure eight thing as representing h of x comma y. This circle will represent h of x. This circle will represent h of y. This little bit will be h of y given x. So the uncertainty reduces by exactly that little shape. That wedge comes out. This little circle will be h of x given y. And that guy in the middle is i x y. And you can verify that this little trick Venn diagram actually gives you the right formulas. Okay? It's not a deep thing. It's not a deep thing because it doesn't even work for three variables, right? But it's just a trick. So this is not a geometric derivation of mutual information. The derivation is what we wrote down here. Yes? Uh, I have a question about what you, what the average of the... Rose. Excellent. So I'll answer that question now. So just to finish off the point before I answer your question, remember why we even went down this route. We went down this route because h of x minus h of x of each row was sometimes positive or sometimes negative. And we hoped, we didn't know, but we hoped that by averaging over all the rows, this i would become positive. Now, can somebody look at the board and tell me whether they think i is positive or not? Is there any reason to think this i is always going to be positive? <coughs> because these entries could be positive or negative. Because this p of x comma y could be greater than or less than p of x times p of y. What is p of x times p of y? p of x times p of y is the distribution we would get in here if x and y were independent. In fact, what distribution is that? We can write it down, right? It's one quarter times that. It's just basically one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty two, one thirty two, all the way down. Right? This is p of x times p of y. This is p of x comma y. This is the distribution you get if x and y are totally independent. This is the actual joint distribution of x and y, which indicates that they somehow influence each other. They are correlated, okay? 
if x and y, not just were uniform, if x and y were truly totally independent, then p of x comma y would exactly be equal to p of x times p of y. And so each of these terms would be zero, and measuring x would give you no information about y, and vice versa, because i would be zero. Okay, so that case is very easy. My question is, how come by adding a bunch of positive and negative numbers here, we know that the output is going to be positive? How do we know that the positives will, be, will outweigh the negatives? Because this is a D. This is a D, exactly. So this is actually a Kullback-Leibler divergence between the joint distribution and the independent distributions. And we already proved that that was greater than or equal to zero. And in fact, equal to zero when those two, two things are exactly the same. Okay? So I, we've come to the end of the class, and I think it's a very surprising result. Very surprising result. And it's sort of, you have to wrap your head around it. Observing certain values of y actually increases your uncertainty of x. But that means that some other value of y is actually going to compensate for it. And it literally has to be that way for any joint distribution you write down. It probably has to be that way because this thing looks like a KL divergence and therefore is positive. Right? But intuitively, why it has to be that way, I don't have a very simple answer for you. Right? But, you know, in a sense, this is Shannon's genius. He pulled out this as the right measure. He pulled out this as the right measure, which captures our intuitive idea that the omega before must be greater than the omega afterwards. Right? And by doing this, the log of that right, will be n times the information, right? So, okay, so we'll stop here. So I think uh, this is actually a perfect place to stop. So what's going to happen now? Uh, today at 5 o'clock, we have a tutorial. Tomorrow at 11.15, we have an exam. Friday at 11.15, after your other exam, I'm going to continue, sorry, sorry. That's right, Friday, Friday at 11.15, after your other exam, I'm going to start off with this definition of mutual information. And I'm going to go through the proof and the explanation for channel, Shannon's channel capacity theorem. Okay? Homeworks, results will be submitted, will be posted online. So if you haven't submitted already, it's almost too late. You should have submitted yesterday. You have a few seconds to submit it. Okay? Small announcement regarding this. Uh, I sent a message on the WhatsApp group with a list of names. And the thing is that some people sent me multiple emails or stuff like this, so I, I, I had difficulties in checking the result. So it's not, I mean, don't panic if you're not in that list, but if you're not, please come to speak to me because I want to check that I'm sure that I got your emails and that I got everything right. Uh, yeah, please, so, please do make sure that he has the homework because the homework is 50% of the grade. Okay.